Uh, now I'd like to call up Will Etheridge, CEO of Pearson North American Education. Will? Hello, everybody. Um, but we all know that Marjorie doesn't need an introduction. But I do appreciate the opportunity to tell some stories, Marjorie. I'm so sorry. Though I won't embarrass you. I do have some secrets. Uh, I first got to know Marjorie uh, 15 years ago when Pearson acquired Prentice Hall, uh, the first of many bold moves Marjorie would make as a CEO. I remember after the acquisition that none of my friends had ever heard of Pearson. And so what I do what many of us did back then, explain that Pearson owned the Financial Times and Penguin. The new CEO was Marjorie Scardino, the first female CEO of the FTSE 500 company. And sometimes, I also explain that Pearson owns some other properties, such as Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, <laughs> and a roster of really successful TV shows. But again, that last bit of information was dangerous because no one ever heard of Pearson TV. They didn't know that Pearson owned uh, Wheel of Fortune, The Price is Right, What's My Line, and Baywatch. <laughs> So how things have changed. Thanks to Marjorie, we no longer have a monopoly in game shows, but we are the world's largest learning company. Um, Marjorie was able to pull off a really a remarkable transformation. Many people know numbers, um, but it's really about the change, it's about how she really changed the company, changed individuals, and changed the industry. And she did it because she fervently believed in the need for change. Um, her vision was for a more personalized, engaging model of learning. To implement that vision, uh, Marjorie led us through an enormous change, moving us into digital services and really a more global business. But she was the glue that held the company together uh, through this change. We all came from different companies, but through her leadership, a common set of values quickly became embedded articulated in the words, imaginative, brave, and decent. But the power was really in the example that Marjorie said. Part of her effectiveness was due to her gift for words. And we can all remember her sayings, such as profits sustain us, but don't define us. And when in doubt, always err on the side of generosity. She also has, as someone said, a wicked sense of humor, um, which she uses to be both charming, but also very demanding. Uh, I remember more than once her saying, when we couldn't meet some deadline, she's always pushing us to go faster. What's taking you so long? My grandmother could move faster than you guys. <laughs> Over the years, I had a ringside seat to see Marjorie's impact on people. I've seen her with school children and teachers, with financial analysts, and she really knew how to take care of those guys. Um, I've seen her with authors, leading thinkers, and little leaders. Uh, when I first took over her responsibility for school, she gave me sort of an induction, and I saw her with Governor Rick Perry. All her Texas roots came out. She has a southern accent. Um, she had it completely in her hand, and we were renegotiating the Texas contract. But where I most saw the power of Marjorie's personal impact was with Pearson employees. And the best way to really see Marjorie in action was to travel with her, as I did many years when we would barnstorm across the country for a two-week tour every year to talk with people about how we were doing as a company and our vision for the future. We flew in a small charter plane to generally two cities a day. Marjorie didn't like planes, uh, little ones. And Marjorie was a star. I was the opening act, as I am now. <laughs> Um, but what's really remarkable was that she was a star, but not a star just in the sense of performance, although Marjorie could give the best speech around. But she was a star because she really had personal relationships with everybody in the company, or most everybody in the company. They come up, she remember them, she always paid attention to them, she wasn't looking at her Blackberry, um, she wasn't tweeting. <laughs> I'm not sure she'd be tweeting now. <laughs> But um, she paid attention to people, and people knew it. Um, Marjorie gave people 
to uh, give power to people's dreams. Um, she set high expectations. And most importantly, she believed in the power of learning as a force for good. She always kept the social purpose, the public trust front and center. So after we finished these two weeks, literally I would come home and just crawl into bed and sleep for two weeks, up to sleep for the weekend. But I knew that Marjorie was still traveling around the globe. She was absolutely um, tireless. She was our leader, but more than that, she was our teacher. And I see so many of my colleagues sitting in this room, as well as former colleagues, and all of us have our stories about how much we've learned from Marjorie, and we're inspired by her, and how we still are inspired by her. And given the impact that Marjorie has had on our industry, it's actually quite remarkable that she came to educational publishing rather late in her career. And in truth, I don't think the term educational publisher truly encompasses what Marjorie thinks is possible for our industry. Don't get me wrong, she believes deeply in the value of publishing, but she re redefined what it means to be an educational publisher. Marjorie prefers the word learning to the word education. Uh, to Marjorie, education is something that is too often done to people. It can suggest boundaries and grade levels and prescribed content. But learning is something we embrace as, individual, in, as individuals, and it is lifelong. Marjorie was also firm about insisting that we put the learner, not just the people adopting our products, at the center of our attention. The seeds of Pearson's focus on efficacy um, were planted by Marjorie, though she also said that efficacy is an ugly word for a beautiful idea. But whether we call ourselves an educational publisher or a learning company, we are in a special business, in an industry filled with great and interesting people. And it has been a special privilege to know and to have worked closely with Marjorie. So it is altogether fitting that Marjorie is being inducted into the Educational Publishers Hall of Fame, not only for her incredible professional achievements, but for the personal example she set as well. As Marjorie taught us, we always should err on the side of generosity. When in doubt, believe that people can do more rather than less. It is good advice for all of us who have the privilege and responsibility of helping all students unlock their potential. So please join me in applauding Marjorie on this most well-deserved honor. Last speech of the night. <laughs> I'm looking to see who's asleep. I'm going to look at the Pearson people first. <laughs> um, I really thank you for that, Will. You can really dress up the truth better than anybody I know. I, I, that, that big donation I promised you for your bicycling helmet charity. <laughs> I really want to thank so many friends from Pearson that I loved and worked with for such a long time for coming out tonight. It really has thrilled me and really made everything special. And I thank the AAP pre K to 12 learning group. Have I got it right? You gotta get a catch your name. I, guess. Um, I do thank you. I thank you, but it is a really undeserved honor. I'm acutely aware that, as Will said, I don't have the credentials to justify this. I didn't, uh, I don't know any of the things that the wonderful Dan Caton knows. Um, I don't know very much about uh, educational publishing at all. I didn't take my first steps in the high grass of curriculum or the tall trees of pedagogy. I didn't know anything about those. Or even books. I was a newspaper person. And you know that takes very little thought. <laughs> um, 
when I finally got into education, I didn't also have to lose any sleep over all of those details of educational publishing, like were we compliant with state standards, or who was going to make the decision, the school board or the teachers, or any of those things, a million issues that had to be thought about and still make educational publishing so challenging. For all those problems, I had the luxury of having um, people in Pearson that I thought were among the best in education, including Dan for a while, even though he did desert. <laughs> <laughs> but I always knew that I could rely on those Pearson people. I could rely on them to worry about all those issues and to get as close to perfect as anybody could be. And they always did. And so for me, I think that they're the ones qualified for this honor tonight and I certainly give it to them. I really just watch from the sidelines. Um, sometimes I kibitzed a little bit and meddled a little bit, but mainly I just annoyed my colleagues by asking, I think, two or three questions. Why does it have to take so long? Why does it have to cost so much? Why can't ours be different from everybody else's books? Those whys took me a very long time to find the answer to, but I finally did. Um, in our first years of becoming an education company, we were doing what all publishers were doing at that point. We, and had done really for decades, um, we were following the theories of teaching and learning that were in vogue, or that looked like they might have a chance of teaching everybody, or teaching most of the kids. We all knew pretty well that we didn't have anything that worked for everybody, but there was no practical way to do that until we finally became partners with technology. And we finally began to understand that technology was not an art form, it was just something that you plugged into. Um, looking back on it, the digital tools we thought then would enliven education didn't really amount to much. Uh, mostly they were gimmicks that we added to books and they probably were more distractions than enlightenments. They didn't do very much to change the essential experience of a book or of a lesson. Um, and we surely didn't do very much to help all kids in the class, those struggling and those that were bored. But what did begin was an evolution um, that is now a revolution, though I think some people see it in the opposite direction. <coughs> Excuse me. But now, today, I think our dreams are beginning to come true. Um, because most all publishers have understood this revolution and they've joined it, along with a lot of brave and clever innovators who stuck, struck out to figure out how to do it because they thought publishers never would figure out how to do it. So, I just thought I might tell you about what the publisher who gets this great honor five years from now ought to have done, at least I hope will have done. First of all, I hope it'll be a she, because I think it will be a she, because she's are floating to the top all the time. <laughs> but I don't think that people ought to be held to things that they can't they can't control like their gender. Um, <laughs> but mostly I hope he or she won't be a publisher. Not that I don't like that title, but that it will be too limited. Um, as Will said, I think that we are not just content purveyors anymore. It won't be in five years. It isn't probably today about medium or platform. It'll be about what the child learns. That inelegant word, outcomes. Um, that person will have helped us, I hope, create working materials and learning systems that are gonna mean we can measure our success by what the students have learned. 
And I don't just mean our psychic success. I mean our fortunes will be aligned with the students' fortunes. And we will have to judge ourselves on that basis. And secondly, that that judgment will include all children, not just the average, not just the middle of the class, not just the smart ones, everybody. Everybody progressing at his or her own rate. They'll be working easily and universally. They will be working truly on their own professional learning, uh, on their own personal learning. The kind that rattles out that kid who you just is so lethargic you can't get him to look up, or shines a light in somebody that can't understand something and suddenly does. Um, following, I hope, for all of these children, their own aptitudes and their own passions, no matter what their level, and being proud of them, all of them, in a very, very um, aggressive way. These first two points, I think, are crucial, and they're not only crucial in human terms, but they're crucial because our national social and economic health depends on it. I've got lots of statistics I'd just love to tell you about how important it is, how important education is, how important economic output is, how important it is for economic output to grow, but that education is the engine of that and it can't grow without it, but it's late and I'm not going to make you memorize those. Um, thirdly, I hope the person who wins this award in about five years will have fought for curriculum reform, or maybe fought for curriculum destruction. Um, will have stopped us all, though, in the process of that. Politicians, educators, parents, will stop us all from having expected too little for our children. That person will have championed holding ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, one that requires a lot out of every child and will be pushed along by the personalized learning systems that I hope happen. I believe this so crucially because I had two grandparents who were teachers and I have to apologize to all the Pearson people who've heard me talk about these grandparents just until they can't stand it anymore. Um, but I used to spend Saturday afternoons with my grandfather, who was a principal of a local um, school, which was K through 12, and I would help him sharpen his pencils while he worked on his reports and did things that people don't, we did things that people don't do anymore, although the reports, I think, still endure. Um, I thought my grandfather was the most marvelous person I knew. Um, and I felt pretty much the same way about my grandmother who taught English and elocution in the school, something that you can plainly see I did not learn. Um, she was very good at it though, and her only drawback was that she was a little demanding. Um, well, she was a lot demanding. Um, over her desk at home, she had a be beautifully lettered little sign. And it hung there all her life, and I certainly had to look at it every day of my life. And I think it expressed the mantra that she and my grandfather both believed. And it said, sometimes one's best is not enough. One must do what's required. I know everybody in Pearson came to hate my grandmother for that sign. <laughs> But at least we must try to demand that people do their best. We don't even call for that these days, I don't think. Finally, I hope the person who gets this award in five years will have understood the changing reality of learning and have done something about that changing reality. Um, when we learn, for instance, early, early childhood education is one of on, the only ways to fight the consequences of growing up in a disadvantaged household. Age four, pre-K, may be too late. You've got to start much earlier. Um, the way we learn, 
We know now that we learn more outside our classrooms than inside, 70% many people say. We learn from social content, talking, working together, tweeting might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, we learn from moving beyond written content to see what we can do with what we've learned, what we've read, how it can help us. And we, of course, learn from experimenting. So those hopes are more reason why I'm undeserving of this prize, because I haven't produced those things. But if in five years those things are old hat, I'm tempted to think that you ought to retire this Hall of Fame and just stop there. Um, but don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that because we need to keep on pushing publishers, educators, to reach further, to do more, to look at life very much differently than we do now. As President Harry Truman put it, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. So thank you very much for all of the people who let me take credit for what they did. And I'm very grateful for this award. Thanks very much.